Hi guys, welcome back to What's the Juice? I am Olivia of Organic Olivia, and this week I wanted to start off by not only saying hello to my day ones, but by welcoming all of my new listeners. Hello, thank you for being here. I hope you get something extremely useful out of each and every episode since this is one of the most sacred, special ways that I give back to my community. And it's something that I love so much. And I'm so happy to be back in my normal podcast schedule and flow. So thank you guys for bearing with me with everything that's happened in 2020 and all the pauses of the show. But it's just been so nice to be back. And it's so nice to see, I guess I wouldn't say new faces around here, but new listeners, new reviews, new DMs on Instagram from people who find me through the pod and who send me such kind messages. You guys are literally the best humans on earth. So today we're talking gut once again, because we all know that your immune system, it lives, breathes, dies in your gut. That's where everything starts. And we know that there's nothing quick, easy, or succinct about healing the gut. So I'm not going to say that this episode covers everything, but today, Dr. Steph and I really do our best to cover as many bases as possible, including getting very specific about these certain strains of gut overgrowth that can cause seemingly unexplainable symptoms in the body, like panic attacks and neck pain and all that good stuff. I always love a a good hyper-specific example because it helps me to connect things to what I'm feeling in my own body. So I (laughs) made sure that I asked her to get real granular with us. This episode is coming out in perfect timing because I actually just got my gut test results back from my doctor and found a few pesky bacterial overgrowths myself, which may explain why I have felt off ever since getting COVID from my dad. I explained in episodes 18 and 19 how heavily I believe the gut and especially the oral microbiome are involved in the disease process of COVID and its severity. And, you know, me having these overgrowths come up makes perfect sense, especially after finding a nice little population of Prevotella in my test results. If you know, you know, but if you don't know, you can head back to episode 19 for more on what Prevotella is and why I'm so fascinated by it, like what this bug does, where it comes from. Or you can even browse my Instagram highlights because I talk a lot about it there and I share studies. But basically, this is an opportunistic oral pathogen. It's commensal flora. It lives in our mouth naturally. But when you're immune compromised, it tends to overgrow and migrate because all of your mucous membranes are connected and your microbiome is connected body-wide. So I believe that this pathogen, Prevotella, may in fact be involved in a secondary bacterial pneumonia in some people who are experiencing respiratory distress and being hospitalized. And in episode 19, Dr. Victoria really echoes that sentiment with her knowledge of the mouth and how these oral pathogens can spread to the lungs. So today, Dr. Steph and I will go over Prevotella because she has been finding it for years, actually, in her pro-athlete clients a lot. And she says that it's often this underlying hidden root cause or trigger in arthritis. So that was super interesting because I had two different bugs that my doctor had mentioned to me. Oh, these could actually be causing like some neck pain for you and some jaw tension and some neck cracking. So It's just wild to think about how these bugs in our guts can actually affect our musculoskeletal system and joint pain and muscle pain and tightness and all of these things that we think are unrelated. In this episode, we will be talking about optimizing your stomach acid production. I know I'm a broken record, but this is so important so that you can avoid overgrowth in the first place. And we know stress will shut down our stomach acid. So of course, I've been trying to be mindful of that over the last few months, but what can you really do, right? I take my bitters, but sometimes I forget and sometimes I'm just not in a state to rest and digest, if you feel me. (laughs) We're also going to be teaching you how to stimulate your vagus nerve consistently because that is her bread and butter. She talks about how the vagus nerve is this master nerve of the body that allows you to get in that rest and digest mode that I'm constantly running after. And this is part of why saying a prayer of gratitude before a meal can actually be so so good for your physical health. We cannot underestimate these things because our actions and our habits affect our nervous system and our nervous system is physical. 
You know, it's you can't separate the emotional and the physical and these tiny little lifestyle habits. So the vagus nerve is what gives us kind of the language and the science to really explain that connection and make it super concrete. We'll also be talking about the importance of optimizing the health of your elimination organs while you're tackling overgrowths. It's really important to keep your liver and kidneys supported. And we're also going to talk about what signs to look for to determine whether or not your elimination pathways are open and functioning properly. She's all about that drainage. Other questions that Dr. Steph will answer today include, can gut bugs actually be involved in panic attacks? Hint, Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> Dr. Steph actually taught me something that I never realized, which is that dysbiotic bacteria can travel up that darn vagus nerve, which is how your gut and gut inflammation and gut overgrowth can actually cause neurological symptoms via that gut-brain axis. Again, the vagus nerve gives us that language to understand the gut-brain axis. It travels up there. Uh, She has a really interesting story too about how she was misdiagnosed with MS, which again, just tells you how much gut bacteria can affect your muscles and your neurological system. Dr. Steph is also going to answer a question about why she starts treating larger parasites first before tackling bacterial infections. This has to do with the waste products that they release within the body. And she's going to talk about why the key to beating SIBO, which I know a lot of you have personal experience with, lies in maintenance, both oral care, which I keep talking about and which we'll hear way more about next week with Dr. B, Ask the Dentist. And she's going to talk about why the use of prokinetics like ginger tea, something as simple as ginger tea, can actually help your intestines throw off some of that dysbiotic bacteria that causes SIBO because the ginger helps with the waves of peristalsis. And those waves help to get that bacteria to move and not lodge there and make a home in your small intestine. So how fabulous is that? Getting back to kitchen medicine and immunity always. (laughs) Dr. Steph also mentioned in our interview that even type 2 diabetes is now being explored as a possible autoimmune condition. And of course, this can once again be explained by the gut microbiome. I just went over this in my Instagram stories. And this brings me back to my own GI map gut test. That is the name of the test that I did with my doctor, Gabrielle Lyon. So I found out that I currently have an overgrowth of something called Klebsiella. And surprise, surprise, this is a commensal (laughs) pathogen in the oral cavity that is natural but can totally overgrow when you're not getting frequent cleanings, hello quarantine. And studies show that Klebsiella is actually a disease mediating microbe in type two diabetes. There are so many studies showing that those with type two diabetes have a Prevotella and Klebsiella dominated enterotype. This explains so much for me because not only did Nick not have those gut symptoms when it came to him getting COVID at the same time as me, But he also has never had any issues in his life with weight or blood sugar. He can eat whatever he wants. Whereas I have been on the border a few times in my life, both with weight and blood sugar just creeping up there. So I also have had a family history of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And Nick really doesn't. It's really only in recent generations. Whereas for me, you know, I have a lot of family members who deal with this. And again, this makes perfect sense because when you look at studies showing that we actually inherit our microbiome just as much as we inherit our genes, you realize that it's all connected. And guess what? When we modulate our microbiome and we, when we improve our microbiome's balance, we can improve and modulate our genes as well, which is something called epigenetics. And it is friggin' groundbreaking. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't have any parasites come up on my test, which is good news because, you know, I had a huge issue with that in the past. That's part of what got me into holistic medicine and herbs, and I have been working on that for years. So really glad that I took care of those large energy suckers. I did have some candida come up, though, which is a fungus. So in a few weeks after we tackle the Klebsiella and the other bacterial overgrowth that my doctor found, I will then be doing a yeast protocol with my doctor, and I will give you guys an update on how I feel then because I have a feeling that it's really going to help to kick the last of these like odd gut symptoms that I've been having after COVID. Anyway, before I leave you with this insanely juicy episode, I just wanted to announce that we just released a discounted gut bundle to go with this episode on organiclivia.com. 
as you know, we don't do ads on this show. So when there is a relevant formula from my line that fits really well with the theme of what we're discussing, I do love to offer podcast listeners a deal on that. So it's already pre-discounted at 10% off and it includes my Parapro formula, my probiotic, which you guys know is targeted for both gut and skin health, really, really incredible for acne, and my Keep It Moving formula. <laughs> Speaks for itself so that everything runs nice and smooth. The link to my website and the gut bundle is going to be in the show notes, but of course you can just head to organicolivia.com slash shop. Thank you guys for listening. Hope you love this one and I will see you next week for another incredible episode on oral care, oral hygiene, holistic dentistry, fluoride, and all that good stuff. Stay juicy. Stay (laughs) juicy. Go ahead, Nick. Well, hello, guys. Oh, gosh. How do I say juicy? <laughs> are you a Leo? I'm a Leo. Okay, all my best friends are Leo. Yes. You are a lymphatic specialist. Yes. You are a craniosacral therapist. Yes. Meditation is a really nice way to connect with yourself. Intimacy with the self. Yes. We can't be drinking that rose water all willy nilly. Oh, is that right? I just never knew this world existed. Yeah, and if you're, you know, enjoying that with your morning coffee, like, take a minute and breathe it in. Breathe it in. Breathe it in. So hello, Dr. Steph. Thank you so much for being here. It is an honor and I cannot wait to get into this conversation with you. Before we get into all things gut health, parasites, overgrowths, all that good stuff. So I'd like to ask a few opening questions. And the first one is, it's time to sign in. What is your sun, moon and rising sign? Okay. My (laughs) sign is Virgo, but now I, I only know my moon sign, which is Pisces. So interesting. Yeah. So you don't know you're rising? No, I kind of want to look it up right now, but <laughs> I'll, I'll add that in after. That would be like your ascendant sign. So they say the ascendant is like who you, how you present in your career. Oh. And whereas your sun is like your personality and your tendencies, and then your moon is like your internal emotional world. Yeah. So. I feel like they fit. So now I'm excited to check the last one. <laughs> okay. And then my second question is what would you title this chapter of your life? Okay. I thought about this one and it's finding my voice. I've been doing so much work behind the scenes and I just want to get better at getting vocal and getting it out there. I'm in the same phase of like, I I really want to share what I've learned, but it's, it goes so deep and everything kind of connects back to each other (laughs) at the end of the day. But it's like, you can't just say, oh, well, you can fix your hormones by doing X, Y, Z. There's so many areas that you need to go back to. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to to communicate it all. So I feel you. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely want to start off by just talking more about you and your background and how you got into this sector of health where you're really digging into people's root causes. And a lot of that is because you had your own journey where you were misdiagnosed basically, and you had to do the digging for yourself into your own root cause. So can you kind of tell us about that and how you got into medicine that way? Yeah. So I would say ever since I was a kid, there was something going on, you know, some underlying stuff that was leading me to never really feel well. You know, I was the person always had some eczema, had some gastrointestinal upset. Like even as a baby, I couldn't use like the plastic diapers. My mom had to use cotton. I couldn't drink from plastic bottles. That was in the eighties, you know, when it was, I don't even know how who was guiding her, but I was very reactive. I was shedding like layers of my skin. And then you get past that somehow and you're into childhood and there was a lot of like digestive upset and then it ebbs and flows. But I came to, everything kind of came crashing down in my last year of chiropractic college because it was a really stressful time. Also, you know, I probably wasn't eating the best. I really wasn't educated on proper nutrition, even though I was in school for an alternative medicine, everything just all at once kind of was stressful and my gut just fell apart. And I remember going in and out of different doctor's offices, trying to find what was going on and, you know, not getting answers or, oh, take this steroid, take that, you know, and I would, every time I take a drug, I'm the type that would have a reaction to it. So Mm -hmm. I never really stuck to any of those. And I just started getting worse and worse to the fact where it turned into like muscle fasciculations, like aching in my body. I would wake up and one side of my face was drooping or my eye was bulging, hair was falling out in chunks, like, you, you know, just 
multiple things and it started getting worse and it would be different every day. Like I didn't know what I was going to wake up with essentially. Wow. Yeah. One of the days I, I was in chiropractor college and I, I actually, we were doing neck adjustments and someone adjusted my neck and some people, you know, know about the correlation between stroke and neck adjustments. Well, I, I didn't have a stroke, but I had stroke like symptoms, but it was because my nervous system was so damaged that I went in with vertigo. I was like, couldn't even stand up like such bad vertigo, but it's just because I was so inflamed. And from a young age, like you just from always a young had age. this inflammation. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it started affecting my nerves in a big way. So, you know, doctors finally started taking me seriously and I was in and out with conventional doctors and, you know, seeing all the different separate specialists and, you know, they were giving me like little bits and pieces. Oh yeah, your muscles dying, but we don't know why. Oh yeah, there's fasciculations. We don't know why. And eventually I saw a neurologist who finally, he did an MRI and they found like, you know, little white specs in my brain. And you have to have five plaques for it to be considered multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. So they pretty much said, you know, you're on the path of having multiple sclerosis. You don't have it yet. So we don't do anything. So maybe here's some, you could take these steroids. Here's some Valium because I was having panic attacks as well, like severe anxiety. And so they were like, here's some Valium so you can sleep because sleep was a big issue. There was just a ton of things going on. And, you know, they kind of just leave you and you're like, that doesn't make sense to me. And no one like connected the dots where I had severe gastrointestinal issues. I had been hospitalized the year before with salmonella and it was only, yeah, like it was, I was passing just blood. So no one ever tied them together. And after they had given me that tentative diagnosis, which is obviously really scary, that's when I found functional medicine. And it was through a simple TED talk, which was Dr. Terry Walls. And it was minding your mitochondria. And she talks about how she was in a tilt recline wheelchair. And she had tried every different medicine that had come out. She had done all the different research. And she she wasn't getting better. She was getting worse and worse. She couldn't walk. She couldn't see her patients. And it was through diet and fixing her gut and, you know, high dose nutrients. She started seeing small changes into bigger changes into now where she was riding her bike to work. And I was like, wow. So that's how it made me dive into functional medicine. And, and I just started trying her stuff on myself and I started getting better for the first time in a long time. And and then that's how I finally got, you know, I got a GI map done or I, or I did a bunch of different stool tests and I saw that I had different infections in my gut. And then there was straight associations with what was going on with me. So I found that super interesting. And then down the road, a diagnosis of celiac disease. So, so in reality, what they were seeing as these plaques or spots in your brain that were, you know, messing with your neuromuscular system were actually not, it wasn't true MS. It was more of an autoimmune type reaction to gluten because of undiagnosed celiac disease. Yeah. Yeah. So there's something called gluten ataxia, mm -hmm. which is when you have a disrupted blood brain barrier as your, your gut lining. So when you have celiac disease, you have damage to your small intestine, small intestinal wall, and it creates a lot of leaky gut, like pretty bad. And your blood brain barrier and your gut brain barrier, they communicate. So it disrupts your, your blood brain barrier. So now these antibodies towards gluten can get into your brain and gluten, which is a protein in wheat, barley, hops, rye, it cross reacts with your own cerebellar tissue. So your cerebellum is what, where your, it keeps your body balanced. So mm -hmm. I, it was getting destroyed because it was being driven by, for me, that kind of autoimmune response. And then my own body was attacking my cerebellum and causing extreme dizziness and extreme inflammation. And not just in my brain, but my legs everywhere, because you have that's like similar structures that your body it's called cross reactions. So your mm -hmm. body cross reacts with it. And for those who want to look that up further at home, it's, you can look up cross reaction. You can look up molecular mimicry, molecular mimicry. but mm -hmm. basically these tissues in the brain in different parts of the brain for different people. So for you, it was the cerebellum, but for another mm -hmm. person, it might be a part of the brain that governs their personality or their ability to find words. Exactly. But basically when you ingest gluten and you have this allergy mm -hmm. to it, your immune system is taught to react to it. It starts reacting to the brain tissue that looks most like it. So this is exactly. actually pretty common. And could, is this part of why so many people feel better going off gluten? 
Yeah, because gluten doesn't just cross-react with your cerebellar tissue. It cross-reacts, like you said, with all different types of tissue in your body. And it's hard for your body to break down that protein, so which is why it stays intact and your body makes an antibody to it. So it can cross-react with so many different things. Absolutely. So, and I think it's such an important point that you mentioned the, you know, the damage to the small intestine and to the tight junctions in the gut that act as this barrier to keep proteins and infections out of the bloodstream. That's what we know as leaky gut. Um, Mm -hmm. But your mucous membranes in the body reflect each other. So when one membrane in the small intestine, for example, becomes leaky or damaged, you can bet that your blood brain barrier, another mucous membrane in the body is also leaky because they all act as one. And that brings me back to what you said, where you were seeing these specialists, but they were just looking at your nervous system or they were just looking at your brain. They weren't connecting it to the gut issues and the blood brain barrier and the gut brain barrier. They were seeing this as a singular issue. Yeah. And they look at gross anatomy and we know that it's like molecular and microbiotic, like all the different bacteria. We know that now. I don't think there's anything that's being properly treated when you're trying to look at gross anatomy. And what you mean by that is like your anatomy, your physical structures in your body can be damaged, like your brain. You can have these spots, but that doesn't mean that the person who's diagnosing that is looking at all at what's causing it. They're just diagnosing no. based on this looks like this, this looks damaged. So here's what we do for that. Here's the drug we give for that. Yeah. And, and the treatment doesn't get to the root cause either. It stops the symptom, like, you know, lowers your immune system instead of getting rid of what's causing your immune system to go awry. Exactly. And that is the crux of autoimmunity that's on the rise, especially in the US, is that our immune systems are dysregulated. They are overstimulated and our nervous systems are overstimulated. We're in fight or flight. We're, you know, looking at these phone notifications, our dopamine is going crazy. Everything in the body is overstimulated. And I'm really excited that in this interview, we're going to touch on the vagus nerve because stimulating your vagus nerve is one of those ways that we can get the body back into parasympathetic mode and help to regulate that immune dysfunction. Yeah. Amazing. So you were basically misdiagnosed with MS. So you're kind of here to bring that connection for us of the gut and the brain. Yes. My gut brain barrier, everything was disrupted completely. And so that's how I kind of thought, oh, the vagus nerve that brings it together. And that's why I named my clinic, the vagus clinic. And that's why I'm passionate about those two things together, but obviously the body just like works as one. So then you just deep dive into what's going on with all of our physiology. And it's super interesting. So I think in order for people to understand how this is all connected and to understand what the vagus nerve is and how it's even involved in digestion and gut health and microbiome balance, I would love for you to just break it down super simple and kind of give us a crash course on the digestive process. Everything from when stomach acid is produced, what the role of stomach acid is, how it stops us from getting certain infections to the role of the small intestine, the gallbladder, bile salts, and then all the way to the vagus nerve. Yeah. So and to simplify it for my, my patients, I usually just have a, a little picture up, but it's that, you know, that mouth is the, what, the start of your tube. And then there's the, the long part of your tube called your esophagus that goes down into your stomach and your, st- and digestion starts when you smell the food, you start to produce saliva, you know, you're supposed to be rested, you eat your food, you're supposed to chew it because your stomach doesn't have teeth. And so the, the more you chew it, the better it is, then you swallow. And as you're doing that, it's it's already cueing through your body that your stomach starts to create digestive juices, create that digestive fire, which is uh, gastric acid, pepsin, and HCL. And mm-hmm. our, our stomach is meant while we're eating to, well, once the food hits there, to get to like a pH of two. And if you understand the pH scale, you know, seven is neutral. The, the lower numbers are very acidic. So if you had a little cup with bile in it or the ac- stomach acid in it, it could burn through a penny if it sat there long enough. So, mm-hmm. but you only want about a tablespoon of that, right? Mm-hmm. So, but, and it takes a lot of energy. So your, your stomach cells are making this very high acidic stomach acid. And then the food hits, it sterilizes your food. It sterilizes what you've swallowed from your mouth. And then it's a big signaling pattern too, because once it goes from your stomach into your small intestine, where it hits first, it's like flipping on a switch because it makes your gallbladder 
have a good gush. If you think of your gallbladder like a turkey baster, right? And it just gets that good gush of bile salts and bicarbonate that, that neutralize it because you don't want that strong, strong acid in the rest of your intestine. Mm -hmm. So we get the neutralizing, you get further breakdown of all your fats, you get your, and you also get your pancreas and it's releasing digestive enzymes and for your carbohydrates and for your proteins. And so that's where you break down. And in your small intestine, that's where you're supposed to five, have 95% of absorption of nutrients. So there's not supposed to be tons of bacteria living there. There's very specific strains of bacteria that live there. They have very specific roles. There's not meant to be a lot of fermentation happening there because we know when we have bacteria, our bacteria ferments. If you think of anything that is fermented, it creates that gas, right? Yes. Our, yeah. Our small intestine isn't equipped for a lot of gases, right? It's very coiled. If you see it, it's like very coiled. And then the large intestine is nice and fat. That's where we have pounds of bacteria living. And that's where whatever we don't absorb as nutrient hits our large intestine. And then that's where we get further breakdown with those good bacteria that make different nutrients or different anti-inflammatory compounds for our body, for our gut. And without those kind of signaling patterns like that high stomach acid and without our vagus nerve, which is in control of signaling, okay, let's make stomach acid. It's, it's, responsible for that turkey baster effect of the gallbladder releasing the bile salts. It signals the pancreas to release the bicarbonate and all of the different digestive enzymes. And, you know, and then it also makes that downward movement of your bowel, which is called peristalsis. So really the vagus nerve comes first. There is no digestion. There's none of those steps of food moving from the mouth to the esophagus, to the stomach, no. to the small intestine, to the squirting of bile, to the release of yeah. stomach acid. None yeah. of that happens without no. the vagus nerve being engaged first, either by relaxation, getting calm before a meal, yeah. saying a prayer before a meal, mm -hmm. being present or, you know, actually preparing the meal as a meditation or through just having healthy vagal tone that knows, okay, it's mealtime. We're going to switch into parasympathetic mode, right? Exactly. And I think that's so important because as we move into talking about parasites and overgrowths, it all, like we said, it all goes back to the vagus nerve because once your vagus nerve is stimulated and your digestive juices start to flow, that stomach acid that moves from the stomach into the small intestine is really what, like you said, keeps everything sterile, keeps overgrowth yes. or, or parasite eggs that you may have ingested from a salad bar or from not washing your hands. It mm -hmm. neutralizes those. It doesn't let them go on to grow and overgrow. And it keeps that small intestine relatively low in those growths that are not supposed to be there. Cause like you said, that's a very selective area. Exactly. So if you don't have enough stomach acid, if you don't have enough bile salts, that's sort of where parasite overgrowth and all of the things that cause all the symptoms we're going to talk about have their chance to begin. So that's exactly. the root cause medicine. What you do is you kind of help people get their digestion, their stomach acid, and this whole cascade back so yeah. that they don't continue having parasite overgrowths. Exactly. Get the sequencing better, get them digesting better, get everything working as it should. And then your body naturally can fight off those things that we get exposed to all the time. Absolutely. We're, and that's what I think people don't understand is that we're always exposed to and always going to be exposed to foodborne pathogens, parasites, yep. their eggs. It's something that we're never going to be able to avoid. Viruses. Yeah. We're, we're <laughs> never going to be able to avoid them. Viruses as well. So it's, yeah. it's really up to the host, to the human to have the healthiest possible biological processes, these built-in defense mechanisms, as simple as producing enough of your own stomach acid to yes. simply keep actual infections away. So you have to strengthen yourself and your own digestive process, your own nervous system signaling your digestive process first, if you ever want to heal your gut and keep growths away. Exactly. So with that being said, I want to kind of dive into the concept of healing your gut because I think this is a phrase that sounds simple. It's touted as like the end all be all for healing autoimmune disease. And it absolutely is. But it's also a hefty task in a sense, because you do once you already have these overgrowths, you do kind of have to weed them out first and then you have to work on maintenance. So can you kind of break it down for us in your practice? What does healing your gut look like and where do you start? Yeah. So 
for me, for my practice, I make everyone do a GI map and an organic acid. And those are just two tests that I can look at what's going on in your small intestine, and what's going on in your gut. So I can get as specific as I can for getting rid of whatever overgrowth that you have. Mm. And so this is because I find different botanicals are specific for different pathogens as well. Okay. So that's yeah, why exactly. Mm-hmm, exactly. I mean, it gives me a lot of guidance as you progress as a practitioner and you see more cases and you are working with more people, you start to see patterns too, clinical patterns that maybe don't come up in a GI map or so you're, you're marrying those two before you treat them. But for a short term, before I start killing, I want to make sure that they can handle the, the killing protocol. Cause we were talking about this before you can have like die off symptoms, right? Because mm-hmm. as bacteria, parasites, viruses, as they get released or they die, they give off toxins, they harbor things like heavy metals, they harbor other metabolites that get released. So we want the person to be strong. So there'll be like a short time where I'm supporting someone's mitochondria, which is like giving them specific nutrients that they may be low in anything to make them stronger mm-hmm. as, as I treat the parasites, but then I'm weeding out the bad parasites, the bat, the bigger things first. So mm-hmm. the parasites, and then bacteria, viruses, retroviruses, and maybe other co-infections that kind of, I go through some phases. Mm-hmm. And then after that, we're doing more of a re-inoculation, reseeding of the gut where we're introducing like, well, through the whole thing, you're eating lots of good plant fibers that feed good bacteria. You're switching their diet. There's there's a whole bunch, but this is why it's so a, complicated. When yeah, talk about yeah. healing the gut. There's so many pieces. I know, I know. And like you know, you're also already working in tandem on making sure that they have enough stomach acid. Being if it's they're taking bitters before their meals or whatever fits into their lifestyle more. Betaine is something that turns into hydrochloric acid, which is that dig- digestive fire. So we're always making sure that's happening. We're always stimulating the vagus nerve. But if we're going in order, then we're getting rid of those infections, then we're relining, re-inoculating the gut. So in simpler terms, relining, we talked about leaky gut, we give your body nutrients that the gut needs to heal, we support your natural immune system, because 80% of immune systems in your gut, and then re-inoculate is getting all the good bacteria back in so that there's a longer term protection. And at the same time, using binders, Binders are things that I talk to you about how these bacteria die, the parasites die, they give off heavy metals, they give off different toxins. So we want to be binding those things up. So I think it's so important that the first step is, like you said, getting the person healthy enough, getting their nutrient stores to a point where they're eliminating properly. I was actually just reading about it. Yeah. I was reading about the kidneys yesterday and, you know, how when you don't have enough calcium, magnesium, potassium, silica, actually your kidneys, since they spend those minerals in recirculating waste and water in your body, Mm -hmm. you need to have enough of those minerals for your kidneys to even be open and working. So that's the nutrition piece. That's that's sorry. That goes into my first week. Drainage is the huge. You're making sure they're pooping every day. You're making sure that their liver's working. You're making sure that their kidneys are eliminating. So you're getting those nutrients. So that's like the key thing along with working on those like nutrients for your cells, your mitochondria, which are in every cell except your red blood cells. And how do you make sure that someone's kidneys are draining properly? And how do you know if they're not? Well, I mean, if someone's not draining if it's kidneys or liver wise, they usually, they have a lot of symptoms. So people that are very symptomatic, because I work with a lot of healthy people. Yes, exactly. Who still have aches and all these unexplained systemic toxicity symptoms. Yeah. So a lot of the time there's, you know, joint soreness in the morning, like that morning hand stiffness is a sign of like backed up drainage. There's so many different symptoms, anxiety, everything, like all of these things come together to show us different symptoms. Darkness around the eyes. That's always yes. a big deal for me. Yes. I know my kidneys are unhappy or overburdened when I have that like darkness. Well, yeah. And then we know that you need the, those minerals you were talking about, like the magnesium and the calcium and the silica and all. So yeah, you can look at actual symptoms that the people are having or just their clinical picture, like what you see. It's interesting because I learned so much from my dad, just talking to him about how he cared for horses because he was a horse trainer and he worked Mm -hmm. really closely with the vet and in the Mm -hmm. horse world, 
There's so many horse supplements. It's very interesting. So I know he would say he was like, you know, whenever I would exercise a horse and the next day they were tied up, meaning their back legs were like almost tied together or kind of like they were clearly like leaning on their back legs because their legs were so much in pain. Whenever you would see them tie up and have those like muscle aches in the hind legs, he would always know that their kidney labs were going to be off. And he would say, well, obviously your kidney is clear lactic acid, your kidneys are going to clear the waste products and the metabolites that are produced during exercise. So if a horse is getting really sore after exercise and not getting better over a few uh, period of a few days, I'm going to give them a kidney flush. And I'm like, why don't we do this to humans? He's a better doctor than every other doctor. (laughs) It's just so funny. He's like, yeah. And then, you know, baking soda would always make them race better because these waste products are acidic and the baking. So I'm like, Okay, so can so, you like treat me? <laughs> that's one of the most common findings with even athletes. Like I treat a lot of athletes. 80% of my clients are athletes. And you, you would be surprised when I do their testing to see how high their lactate is, their lactic acid. And different bacteria can interrupt glycolysis as well. And then you can get a buildup of these metabolites, which yes. is like the lactic acid that you mentioned for the horses. And you don't clear it, kidneys, liver, and then you end up with delayed onset muscle soreness way worse. Exactly. Yeah. That was an issue I was having. I would go to my doctor and I'd say, I'm sore for like four days after I lift. This yeah. is not normal. I can't do a regular routine because I'm just so sore for so long. And she did a few things. One was CoQ10, good for your mitochondria. Yeah. And then another was me working on my kidney health. Because I think in the Western paradigm, there's quote unquote, nothing wrong with your kidneys until one day your kidney labs are off and you already have kidney disease. Yeah. There's really yeah. no interim like diagnostic process where you could see those early signs. And if we look back, to things like horse medicine and like the the things that we know about animals and other creatures. Yeah. There's signs as simple as excessive soreness after exercise that can show that your kidneys just aren't clearing things optimally. So yeah. we have to kind of be those detectives. And um, I love that you're looking for those signs with a patient before you even catapult them into a detox protocol because you want to make sure their elimination organs are open. Yeah. Well, you can make them feel really bad (laughs) when you don't. And, you know, early on when I did my first cleanse, no one told me that. And it was like, I was in bed for like 24 hours. Like, you don't feel good. What else could we be looking for to indicate that our livers aren't detoxing optimally? Skin eruptions. Yeah. Like you detox through your skin, Mm -hmm. um, bad breath, uh, like constipation. So someone who's not Basically, in herbalism, we'd give them alternatives. Alternatives are like, you know, burdock root, red clover, yeah. like they're lymphatics and liver cleansers, quote unquote. They just kind of keep all the pathways open. But for us, signs of somebody who, where their, their bowels, liver, and kidneys aren't open would be definitely soreness, stiffness, puffiness, poor water metabolism, skin eruptions, acne, dry skin, autoimmune issues, chronic yeah. pain, anything like that. Those could all be signs, right? Yeah, it's I don't even know where to start. It's literally like every single symptom that anyone could have, really. And I think that's why so many people move to functional and integrative medicine, because we're in that in-between space where we don't have a disease necessarily, but we Mm -hmm. are so sick and we don't feel well. And, you know, with alternative medicine or functional medicine, you're kind of treating those in between spaces and you're looking for the root cause. You're not just saying, well, this is how it has to be. This is how it is. When you Mm -hmm. turn 30, you're really digging deeper for the things that we're missing as simple as food and gut infections. There's no, in Western medicine, you do a stool test and you know, obviously when parasites are alive inside of you, they're latching onto your gut wall. They're not going to come out in a stool test. They're, the methods are just very ineffective at finding those early budding infections before it's full blown. Yeah, but I find anxiety is a huge one for backed up liver as well. Like people, you, as you start to work on their drainage, even before you start killing anything, they're like, oh, I'm sleeping better. I don't have like also like inflammation, getting up in the middle of the night. There's just so many almost you can trace back almost any kind of symptom PMS, to hormone disorders, totally a liver yeah. thing. And yeah. that kind of connects it also to the 
tr the traditional medicine, not even functional medicine, but just back in the day, you know, Chinese text talking about liver stagnation and, you know, heat in the liver, which would mean that it's not draining properly. Things are getting stuck, stagnant, heating up. It's like yeah. road you're sitting in a car and all the heat is yeah. just building inside of you and you're getting angrier and angrier. That is anger. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Anger and anxiety. Yeah. I always think liver. If those are two of yeah. like your dominant emotions in your daily life, especially in spring, which is the season of the liver, I always think that person needs some, some good liver support and drainage support. And then local pain of the liver, like dull aches, aching after eating fat, not feeling like eating fat is often like a sign of a clogged liver. Poor digestion, like yeah, I always ask people, how do you feel after eating like potato chips or nuts? Or mm -hmm. you know, do you feel gross and like you're just laid out on the couch? Or do you feel like you're processing them? And even just the color of their stool, like looking for yeah. signs of fat malabsorption in their stool, if their stool is clay color or light. Floating. So there's so many, you just really yeah. do have to be a detective. And again, this is where modern yeah. medicine is so great in these acute situations. But then mm -hmm. when you're really digging into a patient's history and, and looking for these little signs and clues along the way, mm -hmm. there's just no space for that because that's not treatable with a medication and covered by insurance. Yeah, I know. Color of their skin, like face rashes, you know, that rosacea, like autoimmune kind of rash backed up. Yeah. Yeah. So many. So basically, we all could use some good whole liver and kidney support. That's like my motto. I think everybody exactly. needs some mucilage, some bowel moving support, and just mm -hmm. some detox support on a daily basis because we're we're just living a life that we're we're not necessarily designed to live. Yeah, we can't deal with the amount of change that's happened chemical wise, environmentally. What we get exposed to, our genes haven't caught up. Like there's been too much change to our food, too much change, like to chemicals that are allowed to be on things that we're exposed to. You know, in such a short time, especially the yeah. industrial revolution, all the chemicals that were released into the environment. It's just, it's not our grandparents' world. So we don't have our grandparents' issues. We have a very different Completely set different and one. one that's a bit more incognito and difficult to uncover. Yeah, exactly. We're teaching the person how to stimulate their vagus nerve consistently, whether that's through prayer before meals or a moment of gratitude or deep breathing before meals, whatever that looks like. We're teaching them to actually get back into their body before a meal to start this digestive cascade. We are optimizing the release of bile salts, perhaps with some herbs with a meal or, you know, the, the Tutka product that will, that you, you sent for me, which was great. <laughs> And then you are kind of finishing off that process after you've optimized their digestion. That's when you're going in and treating for the actual overgrowths, right? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Great. And so circling it back to the stomach acid piece, obviously in the beginning, when you first work with someone, you're supplementing their stomach acid. So you're giving them betaine HCL or some other supplement that's actually providing them with the stomach acid that their body has almost forgotten how to make in a sense. Yeah. But over time, your goal is to get them off of that and to get them creating their own stomach acid. And that happens through, again, that vagus nerve, which we're going to yeah. keep going back to. Keep, keep working on that. And it even happens with things like bitter foods, you know, eating yep. bitter vegetables with your meals. That's why I'm such a huge fan of digestive bitters and have my formula digestive juice because I just think that that's such an easy way and such a traditional way, the way that we were designed to kind of just, you know, take a little leaf, chew on a leaf that's bitter to get the juices flowing or take a few sprays of a tincture to get those juices flowing because the bitter yes. um, molecules actually not only stimulate your vagus nerve, but they signal your brain to begin that digestive cascade. Yeah. So when you move into like treating the gut, treating the overgrowths, how do you do that? Like how many different tools do you use? Is it the same protocol for everybody? Is it different based on the bugs that come up on their GI map? Talk to us about what that looks like. Yeah, it's definitely different based on what they have in their GI map. I, I, I layer a lot of, of antimicrobials. I find people can handle them. I'll, I'll have them like start a few days on one, add in another, add in another and see how they're reacting. But they seem to handle them well overall, as, as long as we're like binding up at the same time. But so say if it's H. pylori, I'm using things like mastic gum or artichoke or gingerols, like a different blends. I have different blends that I use of different things to get the H. pylori. And H. pylori is a, a really common bacteria that people are exposed to. I think like 50% of people have had an H. pylori infection. And that is one of the things that actually lowers your stomach acid. So we want to get rid of it. And when I find an overgrowth, I always treat it. And then the parasites that I, it'll be often 
pair of one with something like your pair of pro, mm-hmm. like paired together. And then viruses can be like completely different things that I'm using to treat them. But I use a lot of blended products that kind of are, you know how they have a broad spectrum antibiotic. There's like biocide and it's kind of like a broad spectrum antimicrobial. It gets SIBO, but it also gets some viruses, you know? So they're, they're kind of layered and their protocols are detailed to what I find and what they can handle. Mm-hmm. We start off low dose, then we t- we titrate up. If it's a really big parasitic, if it points to a lot of parasitic stuff, we're doing like really high doses around the full moon. Full moon is when parasites are most active, so it's easier to kill them. And then often at the same time, I'm using a spore-based probiotic, which kind of, I use that on almost everyone and it, it, it educates the immune system in the gut. It feeds keystone strains of bacteria mm-hmm. and helps them actually colonize because regular probiotics, they do good work, but they pass through you. They don't stay in your gut and actually live there and do their good work all the time. So I found that really beneficial, but yeah, it's a different combination based on what we're finding. And why do you target the larger parasites first? I target the larger parasites first because they usually harbor or upregulate the presence of other viruses or bacteria or smaller protozoa. So like bigger worms, which are actually really common. And, you know, you were talking about your dad with the horses, right? Yeah. And how they saw how your dad could notice and he knew what to do. Well, you know, vets deworm dogs all the time. It's part of their like kind of yearly things, right? They de- so. deworm the parasites. I mean, the, the horses all the time. My dad was yeah. constantly, the vet was always deworming the horses and he would mention certain symptoms that they'd have. They'd even give them sulfur as well, yeah. like MSM for parasites. Yeah. And he would say like, you know, when they needed sulfur, when they had parasites, like they would start to get really angry, like repetitive behaviors. They would start to like wow. dig their hooves into the ground like this. They would just sit there and dig. And then again, you think about behavioral issues in humans and you know OCD, other repetitive behaviors. Like we're just not looking at these bugs as a possible reason. And even further, we're not looking at why did we get these bugs in the first place? Because we've always been living with them. Why, why are overgrowth so much more of a problem in our modern world? It's because we as humans are simply weaker. And these, again, these built in mechanisms, protective mechanisms, like our own stomach acid are just not there. And that is the real root cause, you know, no no herbs, no nothing needed. Yeah. Yeah. And no one teaches. We've lost that education. We've lost that connection with food and connection with different practices with even food or what nutrients to use. Like there used to be a lot more tradition that went into eating that we don't have. Like you talked about eating bitters or like, it's kind of like we're on the run, fast food, microwaved meals. Yep. That's why our guts are weaker. Even in Chinese medicine, like every meal is supposed to have all five flavors. So if you're eating a Western diet where it's really just savory and fatty and sweet, like you're having a cheeseburger, um, you're not getting the bitter, the sour or the pungent, which would be the flavors that are actually fighting the microbes while the sweet and the savory are more the nourishment. So you need both sides, but we're really just going for the sweet and the heavy and the nourishment to kind of ground us in a sense. Yeah. So you treat the larger parasites because as you're saying, so often they actually are larger worms that are within us are in a sense, like, again, you think about why are we getting these overgrowths? Are they kind of coming around because we're exposed to heavy metals because we have these bacterial overgrowths and they're kind of trying to come and eat them up? They use heavy metals as one of their fuels, but they also, it's our immune system is lower in our gut. Like, I, uh, most people that I do this GI map on, they have low SIG A, which is our immune system in our gut or our first line of defense. And so when an egg gets introduced into your system, usually your body can get rid of it. Like we were talking about, either it gets killed in the stomach acid or once it hits the intestine, then our other immune responses will attack it and get it. But when our immune system is low, these eggs are able to hatch and then they're able to sustain and stay alive because they then suppress our immune system. There's different bugs that know how to suppress your immune system or they create biofilms around them that make them untouchable basically. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, and something that I forgot to mention when, when you said, what are you using on, is there something you use on everyone? And the reason that I use mimosa pudica seed is because, so we can get an, we have a mucus layer and then we have like a single celled layer of our intestine that protects us from the outside world. That's what gets into our bloodstream is what 
crosses that barrier. So our first line of defense, we have this mucus lining, but it's supposed to be an optimal thickness. And we can get an unhealthy, thickened, sick mucus lining. And so the mimosa pudica seed, which is something that also gets those bigger parasites, it, it's very sticky. Mm -hmm. And it helps to stick on to that unhealthy mucus layer and bring it out. And along with it, it brings different parasites, worms that have safely coiled into there. So that's one of like the big things. And that's what I have found made a huge difference for making people have lasting results after parasite cleanses. Because I feel like what was missing is we still had that thicker, unhealthy mucus layer. So that's why you're combining Para One, which is the cell core bioscience yeah. product that has the mimosa pudica seed with an antimicrobial parasite formula like my Parapro, because you need exactly. not only the antimicrobials, but you need the seed to kind of break up that stickiness and reveal the parasites to the herbs in a sense. Yeah. And other ways people see that kind of stuff that clears out that we get with mimosa pudica is when people go for colonics, you can see like that brown thickness coming out. Like that's an unhealthy layer. It's hard to get that way with a colonic. It's way more efficient with mimosa pudica seed. In my opinion, I've tried it on myself and on numerous people, but it's been a game changer in that sense, because I feel like that thickened mucosal lining is a huge deterrent for us to get a healthy gut. Wow. Is there anything else that people can do to reduce that thickened mucosal lining and also build up a healthier mucosal lining? Yeah. So, I mean, other than what I just mentioned, which is mimosa pudica seed, if you're not working with a practitioner, there's, you know, fasting in between meals or intermittent fasting. And I know you like breakfast, but you can intermittent fast, like where you have an earlier dinner and then yes. you have breakfast. Yep. And because what happens is our microbiome shifts throughout the day. So depending on what we've eaten or if we haven't eaten. So when you're fasting, you actually have a higher amount of these bacteria that actually eat away. Once you don't have food in, they eat away at that thicker mucosal lining. So things like acromantia mucinophilia, that's one of the ones that will digest your unhealthy layer, right? But most of us aren't fasting and like th that four to five hours between meals, working on your vagus nerve, that downward movement gets sloths off those thicker layers. Mm -hmm. So those are just some lifestyle things that can help. And then again, anything that helps support the liver, like you mentioned some like milk thistle and dandelion and all of that, all of that kind of stuff, anything that helps the liver clear, it helps that better movement downwards. And that helps a lot for the mucosal lining as well. Wow. Do you ever do extended fasts other than just like an overnight or do you have your clients do them? Yeah. So once they can handle them, because you have to build up really slowly to fasting, if their blood sugars are off, they're really inflamed. But once we get to a point where they're stable, and I used to be that person that was hypoglycemic between meals, like I would feel like I was going to faint, like shaking like a leaf. And so that's what I slowly did for myself. And that was like a, a game changer for health. It's anti-inflammatory. So I get people to push it from 12 hours in between meals to 16 or 18 to kind of do that for a little while while we're going through the treatment. And then I definitely push it to 24 or 48 hour fasts with people that are willing just water, sometimes juices and bitters, not high sugar ones though. Like I like more of that kind of like autophagy really... Mm -hmm kind of clean out the body kind of system. So once a month, I'll do a 24 hour fast. And I try to work up my patients to do that too. I've been thinking about doing like a 24 hour fast, maybe on Sundays, like one day a week to just give everything a rest. Cause also when you're not consuming food, obviously we want to be consuming prebiotic fibers that feed our good bacteria. But if you take a break from consuming anything, you're also just naturally lowering your bacterial load because you don't, yeah. you're not giving them anything to feed on. Exactly. And that's why even in the short term, things like the carnivore diet, people see huge results. Like I used to be the biggest skeptic of it. You know, I'm like, okay, that's like a bit much, but then you get people, oh, I did the carnivore diet and it made me feel better in my joints. And then we can go from there. So if they can't fast, you can do something that's more protein fat based because the plant it kind of spares some muscle tissue too, but not feed with the plant fibers. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Because plant fibers, you, you know, they are fiber that feed bacteria. So if you have lots of overgrowth, starving them out can be really beneficial. And that's where things like SIBO come in, which we'll talk about in a second, because you know a lot of the protocol of SIBO, when you're not utilizing antimicrobials and getting to the root, it's just, oh, well, avoid these certain foods because yeah. they have a specific fiber that mm -hmm. seems to irritate 
you know, the condition of SIBO, but really it's that those specific plant fibers are feeding overgrowth. And if you take care of the overgrowth, you can eventually eat those plant fibers with no issue, which is why something like the carnivore diet, where you're not doing any fiber as a short term, almost like elimination protocol can get Mm -hmm. you in a place where maybe when you include the antimicrobials, you're not even getting as much die off because you've already starved some of the bad bugs. Exactly. So you touched on you know, helping people to preserve their results after a parasite cleanse, because many people will do a parasite protocol and then they'll feel amazing for like a month, two months. And then things kind of just start to go right back downhill, same symptoms, same story. So can you talk to us about, you know, what I feel is the most important piece, which is the maintenance, the aftercare, what does that involve and how does the oral microbiome play a role there? Yeah. So I guess we didn't even touch on the oral microbiome because it, it's such a, it is like a huge thing. If you swallow and you have that bacterial overgrowth parasites and you don't have the acid that we talked about, the stomach acid, then they survive. So, but they're coming from your mouth. So mouth can be a huge source of infections. And, you know, although we're always treating the gut, if someone has a rotting root canal, that is one of the root causes So you have to get that taken out and, you know, put in implants. I get people get ceramic implants. I work with a lot of athletes. They all have damage to their mouth. And then they have like nine root canals in their mouth that have been there for years and they're rotting and that can cause a lot of it. But for maintenance, I have people use during their protocol things to regulate the microbiome in the mouth, which kind of kills the bad bacteria, kills the parasites. And then I have them kind of switch to a probiotic toothpaste, which I really like, which I'm having great results with, but they can do coconut oil pulling, rinses, your immunity, which I use now, swishing that in your mouth. There's like a lot of natural tea tree oil or like, or less aggressive, like rinses that people can use that really help because I have had, and I learned that through experience, I've had patients, they feel so great. And then we never treated their mouth and it just keeps coming back, keeps coming back. They keep getting reinfected. So they have to make these lifestyle changes that keep their stomach acid nice and strong, that keep relaxing their vagus nerve. I leave some people on a really low dose of the the mimosa pudica seed, the para one. I use binders in the long term because even through experiences you and I have had with our own gut is that there has to be like some sort of maintenance in there that is helpful. Even if it's just, you know, a few times a week that you're taking something to help support it. But usually it's something small daily that I have them use. And I have a lot of customers, especially with autoimmune disease, who have felt so much better after doing Parapro that they just say, you know, can I just take two capsules of this indefinitely as part of my routine? Because when I stop, I just don't feel as well. I really Mm. feel like it's keeping things from coming back. And I'm like, yeah, if you're doing a low dose, it's fine over the long term to just kind of have that in there. Because again, so many of these botanicals rather than antibiotics are, they're not killing things across the board. They're very intelligent, the way that plants work, where they will target overgrowths and pathogenic species and leave a lot of the good guys alone, especially in in low quantities. And there's also side benefits to them, you know, like blood sugar regulation, liver function. Yeah. So yeah, I'm totally a proponent of that and I don't see anything wrong with it and people feel better and there's no downside. I even retest people's gut and their good flora looks great, even though they've been on a low dose of one para one, one para pro per day or something. It's just knowing when to use the tools and and how, like when to really ramp them up or switch things up. Like you said, where you're giving people high doses of one formula one week, and then the next week you're switching to a different formula to almost confuse the bugs. There's a time for that. When you have a serious overgrowth, there's a time for that. And then when you're in the maintenance phase, Mm -hmm. going back down and figuring out what works for you long-term. When I'm doing maintenance with some people, what I do is I have them have like a very, very low dose, maybe throughout the month. But then on the full moon, we'll do like a high dose of para one, which is mimosa pudica seed and para pro together, like six to eight capsules, sometimes 12, sometimes higher, depending on what the person's comfortable with, what we've tapered them up to before. They'll do a high dose for like the day before the full moon, day of, day after, because a lot of people do get more symptoms associated around the full moon anyways. And that's when parasites are most active. So we really kind of tackle them then to make sure that we've got them all. And so that gives people like better lasting effects as opposed to like, okay, I feel good for right now, but now my symptoms come back. And then at the same time, I'm always using a binder. So I just want to mention that because we're killing off a lot of different parasites and larger parasites. 
And a binder would be something like, you know, biotoxin binder from the same company that makes para one. And it's basically just charcoals and clays and minerals and different things that bind up either dead bacteria or the metabolites and toxins that are released from the bacteria or anything like that. It's kind of like mopping up the mess Mm -hmm. after we go to war. And then what about diet changes long-term? I mean, there's got to be, in your opinion and your experience, a diet that heals overgrowths versus a diet that feeds overgrowth. So what are your kind of recommendations for your clients, you know, keeping in mind that everybody is bio-individual? Yeah. So at first I put people on a pretty restricted diet just in the short term. It's just kind of like a more aggressive approach. So if they have a high SIBO, which is the small intestinal bacteria, I will put them on like a low FODMAP diet, which Mm -hmm. is the sugar fiber that feeds those bacteria. And, And I'll have them like stay pretty strict on that for six weeks. And then the healthy whole foods that they want to add in kind of one at a time per week to make sure they're not reacting to it. Because even though a food is a FODMAP food, not everyone reacts to that specific food, there's different bacteria that end up living there. Or if someone has autoimmune disease, I'm going to use autoimmune paleo in the short term. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to, but my, my goal is to treat the gut, fix as many nutrient deficiencies, get rid of like these environmental toxins, get the person to work on if there's any underlying trauma, anything like that, like that all comes together to form autoimmune disease, work on the vagal nerve. And then I'm getting them to, to really get oral tolerance back, which means not react to every food that they're eating because that we've hopefully sealed up their gut, made them more resilient and healthy. I know that's how I feel. I feel like I can eat multiple foods now that I couldn't before. Mm-hmm. And so that's from your immune system regulating better and not having that attack Overstimulated. All the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So for those who don't know what FODMAP means, it's yeah. the, it's a, it's a certain fiber or sugar that's in f- foods like anything from apples to certain nuts, right? Um, avocado, or no, avocado, avocados. Apples. So like there's these certain foods, foods yeah. yeah, very healthy foods that would be removed during an elimination phase of a gut healing diet because you specifically, based on your specific bacterial overgrowths, are reacting to them. You're fermenting them in a way that's not productive to the body until those overgrowths are taken care of. Yeah. So this is kind of like the elimination diet that they'll be on while they're doing a gut protocol, including the the weeding and the feeding. And then what about a maintenance diet for long term? So maintenance, I mean, I kind of tell people these aren't performance enhancing foods. These are gluten. Like you're never going to feel amazing because you're having gluten. So you can use it like as a recreational drug if you don't have a really bad sensitivity to it. You know, some people don't feel something right away. Other people do. So, but really my my advice to them is like, those aren't performance enhancing foods. Why would you give them to your body? I get having them because you're at a party or something like that, like once in a while kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But it's similar to like a paleolithic diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Meat, tubers, all different color fruits and vegetables, just a very healthy, well-rounded diet that you really shouldn't feel like deprived when you're on, like dark chocolate can be used and just anything that's nutrient rich. And I just try to educate them on what those are and what to avoid and then avoid their foods that aren't ever really going to be great for them. You know, yeah. it might be, I can never eat beans. I don't think it, I just can't eat a lot of beans. Just- Neither can my dad. It's so funny. He'll have like one or two beans like on his plate and his blood sugar just goes up. And I think it's a microbiome issue for him. I think it's feeding bacteria that are dysregulating his blood sugar. So yeah, it's so individual based on the person's microbiome. And I eat very similar to, to what you're kind of prescribing as a longer term maintenance diet. I do eat a very paleo diet where I know for me, I react to things like beans and grains. Mm-hmm. So I really just keep my carbs to white rice because that's a grain I don't react to. Same. Gluten-free oats once in a while. And then I focus on starches and tubers. So like plantain, mm-hmm. sweet potato, potato, you know, fruits, all things like that where I can still get carbohydrates, but it's not just your processed grains and bread. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of making those changes. And even if I want like a little sandwich, I'll do like a cassava tuber flour tortilla, or I'll do plantains made into a sandwich. So you can kind of do a little workaround, but it's just kind of finding what keeps your gut the healthiest and the least inflamed long-term. And just knowing that if you have certain foods that inflame you, you really have to see them as a once in a while treat. You cannot continue eating them every week. 
Yeah. If you eat too much, you can overfeed specific things. Like quantity is a, is a huge thing. If you just eat carbs, even if they're healthy carbs, like you can start a huge overgrowth. And that's why diversity in your plant foods is so important. When you're eating this paleo diet long-term, instead of just having sweet potato as your carb for every meal, switching it up with some white rice, with some plantains, with some jicama, parsnips, potatoes, whatever it is, having that varied diet of plant foods improves your gut diversity so that you never have too much of one particular bug. I'm doing a challenge for myself this week, like not on social media, but I'm trying to mimic what that study that came out said about people who eat 30 or more plant foods every week, having a more diverse gut than people who eat 10 or less plant foods. Mm -hmm. So I like wrote up 30 something of plants that I would eat and Mm -hmm. I'm like checking them off for the week to see if I can really hit it. I'm up to like 14 now. But That's I need, great. I, get I, kept, I copied this from, from Datis Karazian. He, he teaches courses and he taught, he does this veggie mashup, he calls mm-hmm. it. And so you get all different herbs, all different vegetables, and you chop them up tiny and you mix them all together. And he like freezes them and like adds them to like, cooks them up in a stir fry or he does smoothies, but you can like, just like That's munch on them. Like, but idea. it's, it's just all of them already like, I was mashed just up saying and to mixed Nick. together. Yeah, yeah. I was just saying to Nick, like we need to like come up with a little cookbook that's called like diversity recipes, like gut diversity recipes, where it's like how many different yes. starches, fibers, plant foods can you pack into one single meal? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's even more genius where you're just taking a few of them, freezing them and throwing them into like a blended soup or a stir fry. Exactly. Amazing. What a great tip. Yeah, it's a great idea. So I use that to help increase diversity while we're kind of going through because I do feel like sometimes people need like a high dose of like a prebiotic fiber after or you slowly dose up. But food is obviously the best way to get it long lasting. We're talking about maintenance. We're talking about getting people to have lasting effects for their gut microbiome and not need to, you know, crash before they do another protocol or. Exactly. Exactly. So I kind of want to dig deeper into like what these bugs can really do and why something as simple as, you know, a gut infection or an overgrowth can wreak so much havoc on someone's life. So the last time we had spoken, we talked about very specific species that you've seen, very specific strains that you've seen cause very specific symptoms. For Mm -hmm. example, you mentioned something about panic attacks, about Hashimoto. So can you kind of talk to us and give us those few concrete examples? Yeah, I do feel like these are powerful. And one of them is extremely powerful because it was me. I mentioned I had those panic attacks and they came out of nowhere and they came on strong. It was insane. So once I did my my stool testing, I had high Campylobacter jejuni is what the bacteria is called. And it creates a toxin that can take a free ride up your vagus nerve, enter your brain, and it inflames the part of your brain that makes you feel fear and anxiety. And it gives panic attacks. It's known to give people panic attacks. So I felt that in a very real way. And proof is in the fact I fix my gut and I don't suffer from anxiety. I can control my thoughts. You lose control. It's that loss of control. It's inflammation in your brain. It's something creating a very specific spot of inflammation in your brain. So that's one thing that comes to mind. And there's some really good studies on things like rheumatoid arthritis because it's these really common autoimmune diseases. And I think they're starting to do more research where they're finding like specific pathogens that can cross react with any autoimmune disease. So for RA, there's things like Prevotella, Proteus, something called M. avium, which is Mycoplasma avium. Epstein-Barr virus. So that's for RA. There's been a lot of studies on those things. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same kind of thing that we, we talked about with that molecular mimicry. So they found that these bacteria have similar protein makeups to the uh, specific part of your joint. So then your joint gets attacked Mm -hmm. essentially. And it's very specific tissue in your joint. So RA is your synovium right? There's two different parts of your joint. There's Mm -hmm. the osteocartilaginous part and there's the synovium. It affects specifically the synovium because that is how it kind of cross reacts. Yeah. So let's just touch on RA for a moment because we we've been referencing it and it's, it's rheumatoid arthritis is what the acronym stands for. It's an autoimmune disease. Like you said, it affects the synovial aspect of the joint. And the reason that we connected originally is because you had mentioned that Prevotella, the secondary bacteria that I am 
convinced is causing the bacterial pneumonia and COVID is one of the major players that you find in the guts of athletes who have rheumatoid arthritis. So can you maybe just touch on that for a moment? What Prevotella is, what symptoms it can cause, and why you seem to be finding it in your athletes? Yes. So rheumatoid arthritis, you mentioned what it was. It's that arthritis in a specific part of your joint. And mostly it's a young person's disease. Like it starts usually young. So one of the drivers that they're finding, and in order to get an autoimmune disease, there has to be a perfect storm. But one of the drivers is this bacteria called Prevotella. And they actually found in joints of people with rheumatoid arthritis that this bacteria went extra intestinally, just like it does for coronavirus. And it's found in the joints. Its DNA is found in the joints. And it also drives up a really inflamed when it overgrows, which I mm -hmm. find this overgrowth a ton, it turns on a specific part of our immune system that's very inflammatory. So it causes inflammation throughout the gut, throughout our joints in different parts of our body. And then it actually can go extra intestinally and affect uh, different areas like your lungs and joints. It's a nasty little guy yeah. <laughs> and it starts in the mouth. So just for our podcast listeners, oh, we yeah. have some, some episodes as well that you can refer to about the oral microbiome where we touch on Prevotella and COVID and even the role that the oral microbiome plays in COVID. And that is because again, when your immune system is weakened as a whole, these opportunistic pathogens that exist in your mouth that we swallow every single day, get a chance to overgrow because the immune system is distracted elsewhere. And again, this is how these infections start in the first place. Our immune systems are distracted, our nervous systems are on overdrive, and our vagus nerve is not being stimulated by the facets of daily life that used to be a given, like being out in nature or being with community and, and saying grace before a meal. Yes. So other things like there's now new evidence of a virus that might be driving this high prevalence of type 2 diabetes. Wow. Yeah. And this is a different kind of effect, not molecular mimicry, but it's called the bystander effect. And what happens is the virus, the Coxsackie virus, is it's an infection in the pancreas and your body's actually trying to get rid of the pancreatic infection and it starts to kill the cells around it, like the islet cells, which create our insulin. And then we start to get those hypoglycemia and all of the other things that come along with diabetes. Diabetes has other infections that are common to it, but that's one that seems like it could be driving it as an autoimmune disease. So I guess the question is there, you know, is it excess sugar that's damaging the pancreas or is it excess sugar that's feeding the pathogens that are damaging the pancreas or both? You know, yeah. it's like, it's really digging deep into these root cause mechanisms where sugar is not just sugar. It's not just overloading the pancreas and increasing insulin. It's actually feeding overgrowth that can damage these organs independently. Yeah. Or maybe making them weaker that these viruses can get in, you know, exactly. they have their own protection as well. Other things like Hashimoto's, there are multiple, multiple triggers for it. Um, mold and candida, which usually come together. We didn't talk about mold, but that's like environmental usually, but then it drives up things like candida and that can cause a lot of cross reaction with the thyroid. H. pylori is a huge one for Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. Epstein-Barr is another one. And again, it creates it's Epstein-Barr is a virus that people know about can cause mono, but chronically it can actually infect the actual thyroid cells. And then that's when people can get Hashimoto's, but painful thyroid Hashimoto. So your, your thyroid's actually like very tender to touch because the virus can get into the actual thyroid. Another interesting one is botulism, you know, Botox. Yeah. Right. The botulism toxin is from something called Clostridium botuli. Mm -hmm. And it, it creates that toxin and that toxin cross reacts with your thyroid. So that can drive Hashimoto's. There's Yersinia, which is similar to like salmonella. Mm -hmm. It's called Yersinia enterocolitica. That one is, is cross reacts with the thyroid. And then, you know how with, when you have cats, they tell you when you're pregnant, don't clean the litter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Cause of so, toxoplasma. Yeah. So toxoplasma is a driver for Hashimoto's. Wow. But again, these are all things that we're most likely going to be exposed to. It's when they overgrow that they actually affect these organs. So really, you're, you're looking at the reasons why they're overgrowing. Why is the thyroid weakened to where the virus can invade the thyroid cells? Maybe a selenium deficiency, maybe a zinc deficiency. You know, exactly. there's. it's more, again, that I want to always take it back to the fact that it's 
us as the human, our terrain is weakened and these microbes seek weakened or diseased tissue. That is what it is at the end of the day. Microbes do not seek healthy tissue. They don't proliferate. No, they do not. So that is a a very important point. And people are just so unhealthy. So they have multiple organs that are being affected. And that's what lupus is. And lupus can be like cytomegalovirus is a huge one for lupus, which is a common autoimmune disease. But there's also autism, different parasites for autism, but SIBO for autism is a huge driver. C. difficile, like we do an organic acid test. And when it's autistic kids, there's often like this high, high organic acid that's found in their urine that shouldn't be there. That's the toxin that's being given off by C. difficile. And we know that they have an infection somewhere. So just yesterday, the psychiatrist at the hospital called me and mentioned that she believes my mom is suffering from acute encephalitis due to not only COVID, but like a UTI. So she was explaining how recurring UTIs in older people who are immune compromised can literally inflame your brain to where it causes delirium to where it causes like all these behaviors that she's experiencing. And it just makes me think like how many times is a a UTI in, in a 25, 30 year old inflaming their brain and they're not realizing it and causing certain behaviors or depressive feelings or thoughts. Like we just don't, we don't understand the extent to which the infections in other areas of the body affect our brain. Well, even your brain can get infections. That's another thing that is for Alzheimer's. There's oral pathogens that can get into the brain. Campylobacter zygini is one of the drivers for Alzheimer's and your brain's inflamed. And when your brain's inflamed, your vagus nerve gets inflamed. Your vagus nerve is what allows your bladder to empty fully. And when you don't, that's when you start to harbor bacteria. So there's two-way kind of feedback. That's what's going on with her. She's not emptying her bladder. She's like retaining. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And like E. coli is a huge driver for Alzheimer's and E. coli is what causes, causes UTIs. A UTI. Yeah. How does E. coli drive Alzheimer's? Is it the, the toxin that it releases? They used to think your brain was sterile, but it's not. Now they know that there's a breach in the barrier and amyloid plaques are your body trying to create an antimicrobial to kill off these bacteria. And so it's like the same plaque that can be in your teeth, right? Can be the amyloid plaques because it's traveling up the barrier. Exactly. Even in Parkinson's, there was just a recent study that showed the plaques that you see in Parkinson's can start in the gut. It goes up from the vagus nerve. So it's like this bi-directional highway. So really you always want your vagus nerve going down. You always want it stimulated to where the cascade is going downward rather than it being inflamed to where things can travel up the vagus nerve. Exactly. So that's kind of where I want to lead it into the vagus nerve. Who is she? Can you please give us a breakdown on who she is, what she's doing, what's going on, where it is, and why we need to know about it? Okay. She is powerful. I will tell you that. She's in control of everything in our body. She has a hand in literally every mechanism in your body. Every organ has some sort of innervation by this powerful, powerful nerve. There's two of them. They come from your brain stem on each side and they start from it's a cranial nerve and they come through your neck and they innervate your heart, your kidney, your liver, your intestines. That's what we're talking about. And it's very, very calming nerve. So it's your parasympathetic side. So we talk about fight or flight. That's your sympathetic nervous system. Your parasympathetic is your rest and digest side. So that's why we want to turn it on before we're eating. And we were just talking about how to activate vagus nerve, but I can't talk about the vagus nerve without talking about heart math, heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. So the vagus nerve is broken down into two parts. This is the new theory on it. There's the anterior and the dorsal. So it's just judged by where it comes off of your brainstem and the anterior does all above your diaphragm. So it's more your heart. And then the dorsal does below, which is all the, the organs below. So they say that you can be in sympathetic, which is fight or flight. You can be in parasympathetic, which is rest and digest, or you can shut off. And that's when you're in too much in your dorsal. So we want balance between the two sides of our vagus nerve as well. And when we're in good coherence, which is when we have good heart rate variability. So every time your heart beats, there's a different rate. Because if you think about your, your arm or you're doing a bicep curl, when you do a bicep curl, but you only trained it like in half the range, that's not healthy. You're not going to have good movement through the joint. We want to use our whole heart muscle. So the rate at which we pump our heart changes at each rate. And the better that you do that, the healthier you are, the healthier your vagus nerve is. So that's a way that people can train it 
as well. And there's little like biofeedback things you can clip on your ear that will show like how your heart rate variability is. And then they train you using your breath. So you have that biofeedback and it's like, hey, take a deep breath in hold it, take a deep breath out. And you see that you stay in the green. So it'll be like you're in the red because you're stressed and then it'll coach you into feeling better. And then you try to use that in your daily life to turn on your vagus nerve. That's heart rate variability is one of the most powerful ways you do have to get something to kind of read it. But also I have to mention this is that the vagus nerve, there's now implantations that they put on the vagus nerve, right? Because of course, instead of like healing your gut, doing all of that medicine just wants to like implant something and zap you or something. But but it's really interesting because these implantations where you can stim your vagus nerve are reversing things like RA without working on the gut because it's so anti-inflammatory for your vagus nerve to be turned on. And that does it in a way that would take us so much training. And then what about examples of things that people can do to increase their vagal tone, to activate their vagus nerve and things that they should be doing, you know, not only before a meal, but throughout the whole entire week? So there's numerous ways that you can activate your vagus nerve. One of the most powerful ones is kind of uncomfortable and it's gagging, like activating that gag reflex because the vagus nerve is also responsible for lifting your palate during swallowing. So it's like almost doing a bicep curl for your vagus nerve is activating that gag reflex. Gargling is a little less invasive, I guess, but, and you don't want to hurt yourself. You're just using like a tongue depressor and you're just pushing to the back of your tongue to, to make yourself gag. Gargling, you want to be like aggressively gargling at it as part of your oral care. I mean, I gag anyway when I, when I brush my tongue. So <laughs> I guess I'm doing a good thing. Exactly. But gargling, you want to gargle for at least a minute and you kind of want to exaggerate that gargling. You want to be like really given her <laughs> for that to be helpful. But there's things like being in nature, meditation, cold showers, even splashing freezing cold water on your face activates your vagus nerve. Wow. One thing that I get people to do that are pretty anxious is your vagus nerve also innervates the skin just over your ear. It's called the tragus of your ear. Mm -hmm. So, and I get people to get a toothpick and tap it. Cause if you can't get acupuncture, I do acupuncture, right? But the vagus nerve comes down here and I get them to tap. So you can tap in your hand here. This helps affect your vagus nerve. It's an acupuncture point. Mm -hmm. You can tap your tragus. You can tap down your neck to your vagus nerve over your collarbone. All okay. of that is something that I get people to do if they're having like acute anxiety or stress, but it does help turn on your vagus nerve. Now I get weirded out when I touch my tragus, like when Nick will like touch it or when I, I, I hate having this part of my ear touch. Is that because really? my nerve is screwed? <laughs> Yeah, it might be because that could be a signal. You should uh, desensitize that and see how you feel overall. Well, I'm going to do the toothpick thing now. So I'm, yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> and then you can get acupuncture if you have an acupuncturist close to you. There's acupuncture is well known to affect the vagus nerve. It just creates homeostasis. Most of us are in like this like fight or flight. Not only does it make you lie there, but it's in specific spots that are really powerful for bringing your body back to balance. And usually yeah. that means turning on your vagus nerve. And then, like we said, just deep box breaths before meal, which is when you breathe in for four to five seconds, you hold that breath in your, in your lungs. And then you breathe out for four to five seconds. Like that kind of thing is really helps to turn on your vagus nerve. And you mentioned humming and singing too, right? Humming, singing. That's so incredible that just artificially even st stimulating the vagus nerve is helping with gut based issues. And again, it goes back to the fact that if we're healthy humans that are managing our stress and engaging in activities that stimulate our vagus nerve, it's so much harder for us to get gut infections because it naturally fixes the gut's environment when everything's turned on and stomach acids flowing. It's just incredible. It's really powerful. Well, <laughs> beautiful. We covered so much. One last thing I wanted to touch on. You mentioned last time that microbes turn on the T4 in our thyroid. Oh yeah. So microbes, so our healthy microbiome is what changes 20 to 25% of our T4 into active T3. Wow. And, and that also happens in the liver and kidneys. Yeah. Yeah. So that's where the other that percent goes back are. to the basics. Like you said, the first three things you work on with everyone is their digestion and elimination, their microbiome. 
because your yeah. micro your microbiome can't be healthy if you're not pooping and eliminating exactly. um, their liver and their kidneys. So when you again you think about a thyroid disorder, someone comes to me as an an herbalist with a thyroid issue or low thyroid, and the first thing I do with them might have nothing to do with their hormones or thyroids. It might have everything to do with their gut their liver and their kidneys, because that's where the conversion of thyroid hormone takes place. So to kind of wrap this up, because we gave so much info here today and went on so many tangents, I just always want to bring it back to the simplest steps. I wanted to ask you, what is the most important thing that you think people should know about their microbiome, especially after this conversation? I think the most important thing you should know about your microbiome is that it is the root for your health. Like the healthier you get it, the healthier you're going to be. How can you get it healthier? You eat all those different plant fibers. You all eat all the different colors. You eat tubers and you eat whole foods and you nourish it. If you have problems, find someone that's a practitioner that knows how to look into your gut. There's so much free information out there. Learn about it. There's a lot of like easy steps you can do. Activate your vagus nerve. Do those exercises. Even I can send the link to my website where I go over all of the different ones. You know, stomach acid, eat those bitters, like take just the little tidbits that we gave you here. Those are going to help you to make changes, but cut out those bad foods. Even something as simple as green tea acting as a bitter, just drink green tea a few times a day. The the bitter flavor of it will activate your vagus nerve and will help to kill off pathogens and will act as that digestive bitter to activate your stomach acid. So it's these simple little things. It's tiny changes. Hang out with healthy friends. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Okay. And then the second question is, I guess you kind of answered this, but what is the most important thing people can do today right now after they listen to this episode for their microbiome? Yeah, so I guess I covered some of it, but I could go on for days. I mean, if you don't, if you have digestive symptoms, start to find some basic stuff like fermented food that helps it increase, like see what you can handle, play around with stuff. But mostly it's just education, educate yourself, find people that educate you, follow Olivia, follow (laughs) I'm going to start posting more too. (laughs) Good. Oh, same. I'm like on a, on a lull right now, but it's coming. We're regrouping. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So before you tell us where we can find you and where we can follow you and read all of your amazing Vegas and gut material, I am going to ask my two closing questions. Number one is what keeps you juicy? What keeps me juicy? I can't do right now. And it's traveling to like (laughs) places that I get to sit on the beach and go salsa dancing. But since I can't do that, it's just being around people that I love and just I appreciate that even more now from being not able to do that. Same here. Same here. And then the second question is what keeps you spicy? You know what I love? And this is what I'm into right now is all the Joe Dispenza, like how can we change our mind and change our whole being? But like, you know, I know it's not salsa dancing, but to me it's sexy. (laughs) Like salsa dancing meditation for your brain. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. Okay, cool. We'll we'll even put a link to Joe Dispenza because I love him too. He's he's doing some good things. All right, cool. So please tell us where we can find you. And and obviously we'll have all these links in the show notes too, but let us know your website, Instagram, and all that good stuff. So my website is vegasclinic.com or healyourcutfirst.com. And you can find me on Instagram as Dr. S. Canistrero. And also there's a Vegas Clinic Instagram now as well. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions after this episode. So maybe we could do like a a part two or a QA and a in the future. Would love to. Thanks so much for having me. Stay juicy. Stay juicy. <laughs> Great.